The purpose of this six episode documentary series on WDSC WRPT Opioids Crisis in the Northland is to start a conversation. In this series, we will trace the epidemic, tell stories of addiction, discuss treatment, assess law and addiction, seek accountability for the crisis, and address solutions. In this episode, we're focusing on law enforcement and the drug courts. You'll hear from agencies on different levels, from the Duluth Police Chief to a DEA special agent. You'll also hear from drug court participants. The cartel, drugs, and gangs. There's a dark side to Duluth needing exposure. In the global market for illegal opioids, Duluth has become a hotbed. Duluth is under Drug Enforcement Administration Special Agent Ken Solek's jurisdiction. He says Duluth's ultimate source of illicit opioids comes from Mexico and Chicago, and that the Canadian border and shipping port is less of a concern. Whenever you have a border, the concern is going to be dependent upon how the enforcement on the other side of that border is. Um, so if Canada, because they're experiencing a very similar meth or a, a very similar issue with fentanyl, with heroin overdoses, with opioid issues, I don't foresee that it's to an advantage of an organization to say get fentanyl in Canada and then ship it down to the U.S. or vice versa, because they're both experiencing the issue. So that means we know that the organizations have penetrated those areas, the drug trafficking organizations. So unless there's some kind of um, some kind of advantage for that organization, it, it probably wouldn't come into play for the fentanyl opioid side of the house. Now, does that mean that we don't make seizures? Of course, CBP up there, Customs Border Protection, Border Patrol, they make seizures. And with the port system, when you're talking ports and when you're talking mass transit and begin, be it the railways and every, we know the cartels utilize those systems south of the border to try to push their narcotics north because of the bulk and the, and the size. When you're talking about methamphetamine, you're usually talking pounds. When you're talking about cocaine, you're usually talking kilos. Kilos, 2.2 pounds. When you're talking marijuana, you're talking bales. You're talking pounds, hundreds of pounds. So it, it just takes, it takes a vessel or you know, a mode of transport that can handle a bulk system like that. That's why your ports are popular. And of course, the fact that it's coming from another country. When you're talking about Canadian US and you're talking fentanyl, Fentanyl, a sandwich bag full of fentanyl would last you, could last, potentially last you if it was pure a year. So you don't need that size. You know, you don't need that transportation system. It'd be much easier just to have something mailed to you, which we know is occurring. Um, or just bring it on your person. You know, it's, it's pretty easy to conceal something that small as opposed to walking around with a kilo of cocaine, you know. Well, I think we were talking about car fentanyl which is an analog of fentanyl. It's, it's many times more potent than fentanyl. Some of the, um, it, it would take approximately, if, if you were to take one of the little packs of sugar, like one of the little equal packs or splendid packs or sugar pack, that is enough to kill about five or 50,000 people. So population to lose 86,000 people. Imagine two sugar packs of pure fentanyl, assuming that people didn't have tolerance and you know, there's, there's all kinds of variables, but that, that shows you the extent of what can happen with with car fentanyl. Fentanyl, it's a little bit less because it's, it's not as powerful. So maybe it takes 10 packs, you know? It, it, it's really semantics because it's, it's that bad where you're talking about such a minute amount uh, to, to cause such extensive damage. Drugs in general are gonna be dependent upon the type of drug that we're talking about because different ones are gonna come from different areas of the country. But for the most part, most of the narcotics that, that flood the Midwest and the upper Midwest are coming from south of the border of the Mexico area, uh, controlled by the cartels, whether it be methamphetamine, whether it be heroin, whether it be fentanyl. For the vast majority of those narcotics are coming from the south, um, ultimately. Now, the routes may take them coming from the west coast through California and across. They may come straight up from the south. They may detour and go towards the west in the U.S. and then come back. But they're traveling the traditional drug trafficking routes that they've used for decades. They're a business. I mean, they're supplying a commodity to, you know, the American public. Unfortunately, that commodity leads to death in a lot of cases, leads to abuse, it leads to substance abuse. There's no quality control. You can't stress that enough. You can't put it in, you know, street terms enough where you have no idea what you're getting. I mean, you, every time that you're scoring any kind of fentanyl, any kind of opioid derivative, heroin, every one of those drugs can lead to death by one use. When people see that 
well, you know, you're messing with the, the, the lower level dealer or the lower level, say the attic. A lot of times we have to start somewhere and to work ourselves up the chain. Sometimes that's all we have. So do you fault us because we are, we are involved in the community and we're trying to work, the, you know, the problems by working our way up? Unfortunately, we can't stop at, start at the top all the time. You know, sometimes we have to take steps to get there. And so I think that's something that needs to be understood too, especially in the drug world. Unfortunately, when we're talking about heroin and fentanyl in the opioid side of the house, you gotta remember that lowest level person, if they're getting two or three doses, that could be two or three deaths. You've gotta remember the Drug Enforcement Administration is exactly as the name sounds. It's an enforcement arm. It's a law enforcement body. We don't get into the treatment of individuals. That's another agency. That's several other agencies in the U.S. government provide resources and funds and, and education on that part. But we try to put everybody in the same room. I can tell you from Duluth, they're doing that on a local level and have been for the longest time. Duluth Police Chief Mike Tuscan believes we can't arrest our way out of this problem, although others do disagree. We have uh, very robust enforcement. In fact, our, our task force that, that Lieutenant Kazel runs is uh, second to none in the state. Uh, very well run operation. Again, that is trying to, to limit source of supply. We know from uh, some of the defendants that have been at the, uh, up at the jail uh, and some of their, uh, their uh, conversations that they've had is, we're not coming back to the city because as soon as you try to set up in Duluth, the police are there. And so we know that, that, is a, uh, uh, that there is a message that we've delivered that this is not the place that we, you can uh, easily blend into the community and set up shop and, and distribute these poisons to our people. Uh, so that is impacting, so that we know that's working. I think that uh, the not naloxone initiative, the fact that we've saved over 50 lives, that, that people have an opportunity to uh, recover, uh, that's working. Uh, and we're looking at now, uh, last year we did DARE in the schools, uh, did a pilot, but we're also now looking at uh, some other options to do further education with, with uh, students uh, six, seven, eight, nine, and into uh, the middle school as well, uh, trying to educate. Nationally and locally, law has a 360 degree fight against opioids from the sky, ground, underground, railway, highways, ports, borders. Commander of the Lake Superior Drug and Violent Crime Task Force, Jeff Kazel, is familiar with the ingenuity of drug rings. There are no poppy fields in, in Minnesota. Um, the, uh, the Mexican cartels, uh, they used to be the middlemen for, for the, uh, South America. A lot of the, the drugs, you know, cocaine um, and heroin were being produced in, in, uh, in South America. Uh, but they changed their marketing. They, they decided to, to grow opioids uh, and poppy fields in, in Mexico. Um, and as time went on, they, they found out about fentanyl and they, uh, they've uh, got people that are able to order the, the, the chemicals and, and put the fentanyl in their, their product. And, and majority of the product that they're sending up is, is gonna have fentanyl in it. That was seized in Duluth. It's a cartel stamp. There's multiple ways of getting into the country. I mean, they've got tunnels that they've, they've built underneath the, the border. They, they um, down in El Paso, one of the, the border uh, areas where they have miles of, of, of cars getting into the country, and um, it's just the, the numbers game. How many how many cars have uh, loads in them, and how many are able to get through? And uh, that's all part of the business of, of these these uh, cartels is getting those loads through. They'll, they'll make specific compartments, you know, and add them on the cars. I mean, they've, they've got submarines that they've used to transport drugs to the United States. They've got planes, they've got drones that they're now using to throw it over the border. So there, any way that they can get the product over, they're gonna do it because they're gonna make money and they know it. And there's a big reason why, you know, the statistic that 80% of the opioids in the world are consumed in the United States. There is a large pool of addiction that they can come here to take advantage of, and they are taking advantage of. They're, they're selling a uh, product for two to three to four times the amount that they, what they would receive somewhere else. They are taking advantage uh, of our, our, our population, of our people, and making a profit on it.
the epidemic does not distinguish between age, sex, or location. And with an increased death count, there is a need for better coordination. We went to the DEA and we, uh, we started a, a program first in the nation where uh, we uh, took one of our investigators and made them a DEA task force officer uh, for the diversion unit. Uh, which is deals with opioids and, and pills being diverted. We went to the National Guard and uh, we, we uh, asked them for their help and through their, their counter drug program, they, they gave us a full-time analyst and analysts are they're worth their weight in gold because there's, there's just so much data that goes in with dealing with these organizations that are selling. And we've partnered with the ORS group that we were talking about earlier about in uh, helped write uh, a, a grant where they were able to get, I think it was about $600,000 to get a, a treatment uh, place um, at, with the Center for Alcohol and Drug Treatment, six bed facility for, for people that are uh, substance use disorder with opioids. The CDC acknowledges that many health departments, law enforcement and community-based organizations are uniting. I'm not, um, we're not as far as intel on that we're not as far as the street level we're more the information takers and we we push it up and then our awesome team that you know the drug task force that works with local agencies they'll put stuff together and come up with plans on how to crack down on it so and they're doing a really good job so i would say there's weekly we get weekly calls on it um sometimes like i said we'll get more calls than none um it i guess it depends on if people are getting how are people are getting money when their main source of income coming in um, as a new batch came around or if there's a good strand like this it hasn't it's been a slower week for us but I would say like today we had one um, but I mean it's it's almost calls daily about some kind of you know drug suspicion or I wouldn't say every day an overdose, but there are some weeks where we do get that. A citizen might call saying there's someone that's not acting like themselves, or they seem like they're higher impaired, um, very lethargic. So we'll check on them just to make sure that they're taken care of and uh, get them the help they need if they need to be a hospital, Gold Cross. So yeah, that's where we got one yesterday here. Well, that's good. Someone cleaned some of the stuff up. I thought there was some. Yesterday. But that's a spot because it's kind of off in the alley. There's no cameras back here. And we get a lot of people actually in cars that are, um, we'll get overdoses in cars. And a lot of times, maybe a friend might call in our concerned person saying, hey, this person is overdosing. And then by the time we get there, they're gone because at least you know, they want to help their friend. But um, they don't want to get in trouble. Technically, we're not there to get the person who's overdosing in trouble where there as a life-saving effort. So that's kind of like the least of our concerns at that time. So this is our kit. Um, so it's bright red. Uh, everyone usually has one in their duty bag. And then in the inside, it has uh, two doses of Narcan. And ours are the nasal version. I know there's um, the liquid forms and everything like that, but this is the most um, user-friendly as far as techniques go, because you don't have to worry about dealing with needles or anything. So this is the Narcan. Um, what we'll do is we'll administer in their nasal passage. Um, you know, we'll give the one dose and then we'll wait for a response. If there's not a response, then we, we'll follow up with a second. When we started seeing more and more overdoses occur, um, um, more and more deaths occur, we recognize, well, there's, there's people dying out on the streets. Um, we knew we had to make uh, some changes. You know, I went to my boss, the chief, and, and, and asked for more resources. Uh, and uh, you know, we're a, a medium-sized department and to, to ask to, to pull uh, a body away from the street to, to bring to an investigative unit, that's a big deal. But uh, he recognized the, the issue with, uh, with what was going on and, and he agreed, he gave us another investigator. There, there, there are so many cases that we deal with that uh, I, you know, I, I need more people to, to, to investigate them. Mark Ryanholtz is an addiction counselor with experience in corrections. He believes some of the modalities are outdated. I have worked in corrections uh, in this field. Um, and in particular, the program I was working with, uh, I would have the guys for four weeks while they were in, it was in uh, the jail system, uh, and then I'd have them for 10 weeks while they got out. Um, so, and that was fascinating. It was a really difficult population to work with. Um, there is a function of law enforcement in there. I think that for a lot of people, 
getting the attention, you know, law enforcement attention is the one that actually wakes them up and says, okay, I've got to do something about this. Um, but the repeated criminalization of use issues is actually very detrimental to people that have use issues. Um, and it's mainly detrimental to the fact that uh, it just increases more stress in their lives and makes their lives more difficult. Uh, it doesn't do any good. It's not, it's not uh, uh, any way, shape, or form kind of helping them with the issue. It just exacerbates the situation. Um, so, and then you're talking about how to help people um, through that. You can't arrest our way out of this. Um, the vast majority of people that do, um, there's legitimate physical reasons why the vast majority of people have use issues. It's not a behavior issue. It's not a poor choice issue. Um, corrections in many ways is still based upon the old moral model and behavior model that use issues are still a choice. You're making bad decisions. Valerie Zawendago Zikwi is an enrolled indigenous member in Canada and lives in Duluth. After a dark past of using, drug dealing herself, and overdosing a handful of times, she's found a new path to healing and is now sober. She says she just wanted to get out of jail so she could get high again. I've never been to jail and I never not had to like go completely without heroin or without something to help. So um, I remember being in a holding cell for like four days and uh, just being really sick. Well, I ended up doing a Rule 25 and, um, you know, at that point it wasn't like serious. I wasn't, I wanted to get out of jail. I, I didn't want to be there. I wanted to go get high. Um, so I did it and I was like, well, is this going to get me out? And they're like, well, we got to wait for a treatment bed. And, you know, I got, uh, I think a release of my own recognizance or something like that where they let you go. And so I did that. I went to treatment, um, didn't take it serious. I snuck in, uh, gram and a half. According to a Journal of American Medicine published piece, most prisoners, 80 to 85 percent, who could benefit from drug abuse treatment do not receive it. And not treating a drug abusing offender is a missed opportunity to simultaneously improve both public health and safety. Duluth County Attorney Mark Rubin believes treatment for inmates can change lives if they want it and thinks treatment should begin sooner for addicts behind bars rather than towards the end of their sentences. Some people might think uh, it doesn't pay to send people to prison because there's, a, there's, yeah, there's something there that isn't working too well. The Department of Corrections in Minnesota has one overriding driving goal right now and that's to free up beds in the prison it costs money to keep people in prison. The problem is people are getting released from prison before treatment. When you go to prison for selling drugs, and you may have an addiction problem too, you do not even get into a treatment program towards until you get down to one year left in your sentence, when you could use treatment right off the bat. Uh, and number two, people who are dealing drugs are being released from the Department of Corrections into a, the Challenge Incarceration Program, which has, there's, there's good purpose in that, but there are drug dealers that qualify for that program who we find out on the street, our police department runs into those dealers and their, their full sentence, or they may, might have been a seven or eight year sentence, they maybe did a year of their time. So without enough supervision, without addressing any uh, chemical dependency needs adequately, and also they're predators. They want to make money and they know for some reason people in our area have a healthy, unhealthy appetite for these types of drugs. Drug counselor Kellen Davis is now sober and shares from personal experience how opioid use can lead to criminal activity and it's a path he wishes no one else to lead. There's illegal ways to get opioids all day long. I mean, through the mail, go on the street, you know, there's a hundred different places and ways to get it if you want it. It was very interesting for me when when they they took my Percocets and Oxycontins away, um, because I feel like it it was too little, too late. You know, I feel like they wanted to do a good thing, but I was already wrapped up in addiction. So yeah, I just found a way around it. You know, I, I wasn't gonna argue with them because 
you know, what what point would that serve? You know, I I had dope to get. So I went and got it and it um led me to places that I wish I didn't go. Lynn Hall's son, Brad Christofferson, was killed by an opioid overdose. He went to prison before he died. He really got in trouble with the law when he brought a girl who was wearing a wire to a drug dealer to get her drugs, and then Brad would get free drugs from the guy for himself. Um, and then he was busted with this big drug task force bust that they had here in Duluth. and. They sent him to prison, federal prison for that. I mean, I, I believe that these big time drug dealers need to go to prison, but when a, an addict is just trying to get free drugs, yeah, he, I don't think that he should have gone to prison. He should have gone to treatment. He told me he can get drugs were easier to get in prison than they were on the street. They were just in the next cell. Our, our drug unit, we, we don't go after users. That's not what we're here for, okay? Um, do we end up arresting some users when we, when we do our search warrants or we do our, our uh, uh, operations? Sometimes that happens, yes. But do we go out specifically to target somebody that's uh, uh, a user that's probably got a substance use disorder? No, that's not what we're here for. We're here to take, uh, take the people that are taking advantage of our pool of addiction here, and, and that's what we do. We have a large pool of addiction here, and there are people that are coming uh, to this area specifically to make a lot of money and take advantage of people and you know, eventually kill them or put them in jail because of the use. Uh, drug court has been around a long time in our area. And if we see people that are completing the one, two year program, sometimes even a little longer, but if they can eventually come clean, be clean and live a productive life, um, then it's a success. If they're not engaged in criminal activity again, it's a success. Um, we, we realize though that it, it crosses, if they come into the criminal justice system with an addiction, if they come into the criminal justice system with an addiction, there are also other collateral effects. For instance, there's probably a child protection matter going on at the same time. Eighty-some percent of our child protection cases involve opioid abuse. So it's not just dealing with someone in isolation in the criminal justice system that is going to be in drug court. They've got probably child protection issues, employment issues. They probably can't hold a job because of the addiction. And they also, in order to feed the addiction, what do they have to do? They probably have to steal or engage in something else illegal to afford their addiction. I don't know, why is it so hard to catch these drug dealers too? I, I mean, I know they're out there trying to do that and you know when Brad died they got information from his phone and I I was told that, that drug bust that they had here in Duluth last summer um, that the guy that sold Brad those drugs got caught but for Brad he had bought you know fentanyl he didn't even know that he thought he was buying heroin he didn't have a chance and, the autopsy report, he had three different types of fentanyl. I mean, the drug dealer had to know this was gonna kill him. Nobody could survive the amount of fentanyl. And you, you know, you can't be everything at once. So it's kind of like a struggle to get it all together in a good motion work, because you wanna figure out what's a long-term solution, but you gotta figure out, okay, how do I save them now? The person before anything else first, and that's why I believe our department has these opioid kits because that's what we're here for, life saving. So if you see something, say something. I mean, you don't have to say, you know, my name is Sally Johnson. I live at this address. This is my telephone number, social security number. It's, it's as simple as saying, hey, this is where I'm seeing this. We don't require you to tell your name or anything like that. We take tips. So there's a, there's a tip line also on our website that you can go. I mean, once in a while, you, you'll get a good story, which reminds you, you know, why you do this job is there's a kid that um, me and my partner, we got a call on, and it was to the point where we thought, you know, he wasn't going to make it, and he was able to have Narcan, and, you know, we went to the, fa his family was there, and I went, I didn't see him much after that, and then I went back to his house, like, three or four months later, and I went into the house, and he gave me a hug, and he, you know, he thanked us, he said, you saved my life, and 
you know, and I want to, and I want to change. If you want to report any suspicious activity surrounding illegal opioids, you can do so anonymously by calling the Lake Superior Drug and Violent Crime Task Force at 218-730-5750. Next episode, we're focusing on the case against opioid manufacturers and how lawmakers are working on legislation to combat this public health crisis. Uh, there's a lot of issues about pharma companies, not just opioids, but also how much they're charging for regular prescription drugs. And I think it's time to take them on uh, when it comes to opioids and also when it comes to the price of prescription drugs. And again, for additional information and resources, please visit WDSC.org.